On behalf of Barnard College and Women in Hollywood, it is my honor to welcome you to the 11th Annual Athena Film Festival. This festival is dedicated to celebrating the stories of bold, courageous women leaders and the filmmakers who bring these stories to life. Thank you for joining us. My name is Melissa Silverstein and I'm the artistic director and co-founder of the festival. I am so proud that we have been able to put together a robust festival that reacts and responds to the world we are all living in now. This year's festival would not be possible without the support of our dedicated sponsors. Please join me in thanking Athena's founding sponsor, the Artemis Rising Foundation, and its CEO and founder, Regina K. Scully. Her visionary and leadership makes, it makes our work possible. A special thank you as well to our premium level sponsor, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which shares our commitment to showcasing stories of women in science. To all of our sponsors, whose names you will see before each film and event, thank you for your commitment to challenging our culture to be more inclusive and inspiring audiences in the process. You are in for a treat today. A masterclass with a true master, Gloria calderon Collette. She will be in conversation with Roseanne Welch, who wrote on the OG Beverly Hills 90210, Picket Fences, and other shows. She is also the executive director of Stevens College MFA in TV and screenwriting. Stevens is a true friend to Athena and a partner on our annual TV Writers Lab. If you don't know who Gloria is, you clearly have not been watching television over the last couple of years. So start watching. She is a showrunner, writer, director, and actor best known for the critically acclaimed reboot, One Day at a Time. She is currently working on has a big deal at Amazon, and we're going to hear some of her great shows that she's doing in the future. I'm super excited to hear where, where you're going, and she's just developing shows and movies and is such an important voice in the industry. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Ah, this is so wonderful. Welcome, Gloria. Thank you. It's so lovely to have a chance to talk to you about your craft, because that's what we're excited about at Stevens College and getting more women and underrepresented voices into the medium. And you are a, a founder of that for us. Our audience and students love your work. So I'm going to start with the question they always ask, which is, can you give us your superhero origin story? My superhero. Uh, with a particular focus on when you knew you were a storyteller and how you became in this place today. Oh my goodness. Oh my, I have so many versions of this story that could go hours and hours. So I'll try to give you the most brief version. Uh, so basically I am the daughter of Cuban immigrants. My parents came when they were 15 years old with a suitcase and a dream and uh, not knowing any English. They learned English by watching TV, funnily enough. Uh, so uh, they because of the way that they came here, Miami's not what it is now. So uh, 14,000 Cuban kids, refugees came and different churches and organizations uh, volunteered to take them in, the kindness of strangers at work. Mm -hmm. So my parents both ended up in Portland, Oregon. Uh, the Cu Cuban diaspora is very spread out over this country, mostly in Miami and New Jersey, but we're, all, we're everywhere. We're ever <laughs> Latinos are everywhere, guys. Uh, so I grew up in Portland, Oregon. And it was lovely. It was lovely. I had a really lovely, idyllic childhood. I grew up in a Cuban community, but then there was the broader community at hand. It was very beautiful and green. It's much cooler now than it was when I lived there. Now it's all coffee shops and microbrews. And <laughs> that was not, that was not uh, the case. It was just very green and pretty. Um, and then I moved to San Diego, California uh, a week before my freshman year of high school. So I did four years in San Diego. And then I came to Los Angeles for uh, college. I went to Loyola Marymount University here in LA. When I graduated, uh, I thought I was going to be an actor. And right before I graduated, there was a playwrights festival at school. And I kind of had an inkling that like, oh, you should, write, you should write something. Like write something. Why not write something? Never written anything before. I mean, I, I could write papers quickly, you know, but that was it. I had never written a play before. So I kind of puked out this play that was – that I was just thinking about and it ended up winning the festival. And I was like, Oh, is this a thing? Is this a thing maybe? And then I sort of put it to the side 
and uh, thought like, well, I waste, I mean, I, I, I'm already graduating from college. I wasted my life. I can't now decide I'm a writer at 22. Isn't, aren't we just incredible creatures? <laughs> so I graduated and I started to try the auditioning process in Los Angeles. And all of the parts were drug dealers, girlfriends or drug dealer sisters. <laughs> oh, Maybe a prostitute. That, would, that was exciting. And I'd always have to go in and do, I couldn't speak the way I speak. I'd have to be like, oh, yeah, Chewy, what are you doing? Like, it would be ridiculous. I did not mm -hmm. block those roles. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I really became really frustrated by, obviously, what was out there for my community. So I thought, oh, I should do that writing thing. Maybe I should do more of that writing thing. So <laughs> I decided to apply to grad school. So I got into the University of London, Goldsmiths College. I went to London. While I was there, I worked at the Royal Court Theater, which is the premier uh, new works uh, theater in, in London. Incredible experience. And I wrote like seven plays when I was out there. And I won uh, the, the International Student Play Script Competition that Alan Akeborn funds. And... Uh, a Waterstone Prize and a bunch of stuff that made me feel like, okay, I'm getting outdoor validation. This might be a thing. And then when I came back from England and came to LA, like nobody cares you have a master's degree. <laughs> 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 so that time was useful though. I will never, I mean, that was an expansive experience going to grad school. So I loved that I did it. But when I came back, I really realized like, okay, I have to really focus on the craft of writing. I have to figure out the craft of writing. So I'm fairly self-taught. I just got a bunch of books from the library. I'm a big library person, read a ton of plays, and I would go to the Museum of TV and Radio, now the Paley Center, and I would teach myself. I would sit there and break down scripts and really realized I had to put in the time. I had to put in the time of learning what this craft was. Uh, and so that's what I did. I spent, you know, a year I got, I was fortunate in that, um, I just put myself out there and said, I will take any assistant, any industry job. I just need an industry job. I don't care what it is. I'll PA, I'll get caught, whatever. And my first industry job was working as second assistant for Cameron Crowe, um, which was amazing. And I, guys, you cannot know. Here's the thing. You cannot know anyone. And if you're putting in the time and the work, it just happens. I, I mean, really, you just have to put in the time and the work. Mm -hmm. Um so when I worked for Cameron, it was wonderful because I had a front row seat to, to how he worked. And I also just got to write all day because he just gave me a list of things to do. And as long as I got that list done, he was good. He, he just needed a second. You know, he had a first assistant to do the major things. Uh, so I would just write and write and write and get my list done for Cameron and go to the Paley Center. And uh, I started putting up plays. I realized, like, what is my superpower? What I learned in England was I can put up a play in a black box theater. Easy. So I found uh, the Hudson Avenue Theater, which still exists on, on Santa Monica Boulevard here in L.A., uh, <laughs> and I asked them, what nights are you dark? And they said, well, we yeah, we run usually Thursday through Sunday, so we're dark Monday through Wednesday. And I said, how much would it be to book a stage that has a set on it? And they're like, 200 bucks? I'm like, great. <laughs> so I found out Backstage West in L.A. Weekly – will review your show if it's a six-week run. They may review your show if there's a six-week run. So I booked six Tuesdays <laughs> and I cast a show. I directed the show. I put the show up and I gave free tickets to the cast for opening night only. And I gave free tickets to all my favorite charities. And so the first two Tuesdays we were sold out except for critics who could come whenever they wanted. We'd make a chair for the critics. And then we had a line around the block the rest of the run. Oh. And that is how I got my agent and my manager. They came. Yeah. An assistant told a friend who told an agent who told a, And at the end of that run, I had representation. So it was really like a matter of putting in the time, putting in the hustle, then putting the work out there in a really aggressive way. Um, and then, you know, and then I started working my way up the ladder. I was a writer's assistant and then I became a staff writer and then a story editor, an executive story editor, a co-producer, a supervising <laughs> producer, right? Like I did all the things. Everyone. And then, you know, 12 years after being a journeyman writer on other people's shows, I got my shot to be a showrunner and that was one day at a time. Ah, that's a gorgeous true story that we try to tell people all the time. It is about putting in the work. And yeah. of course, it's the quality of the work that shows. Yes. Oh, and I think, look, I think that I was... I, you know, I worry a lot about, I talk a lot to students who are like just graduating and they're like, Gloria, I have a pilot. You should co-show run with me. I'm like, 
you guys, <laughs> maybe you're the one. Maybe you're the one that can pull that off. Most of the time, that that's not going to go so well. You know, like I think the reason I was successful is because I learned from so many wonderful showrunners that I saw come before me so that by the time I had my seat in the chair, I knew how to do it. You knew the job. Exactly. Right. You put in the time. Yeah. That's so wonderful. So what briefly what was that first play about? The first play is about two people. It's called Plain Strangers and it's about two people that meet on a plane and have a, a remarkable conversation. That's all that's necessary. Yep. That's two one people, night in Miami. Two two chairs. That's what it was. Exactly. Oh, that's beautiful. Beautiful. All right. So my, my favorite question for writers is always, now that you look back at the body of work you've created so far, and as you're planning the future body of work that you're putting together, what theme or themes do you see running through? What are the messages you have to put out there with your work? Hope, joy. Uh, I really feel like I part of my purpose here is to speak to a community that has been wildly underrepresented. So for me, it is not only sad, but really damaging to see the Latino experience, the American Latino experience, uh, reduced to just gangbangers and drug dealers. Uh, you know, every once in a while, we'll get an ugly Betty. Every once in a while, we're going to get a Jane the Virgin. Every once in a while, we'll get a George Lopez show. Those are three. That's three shows. Uh, so it's just not enough. And it's certainly not enough to to affect real change in terms of how people see us. So for me, joy and happiness and thriving are revolutionary things. And showing my community doing all of those things. You know, one day at a time, we talked about very serious issues. Um, but we did so with love and joy and earnestness. And so for me, I'm earnest. I'm not cool. I'm earnest. I'll talk about real stuff. Uh, I want to make you laugh a little bit. And I want to make you feel some feelings. And then you turn the TV off and you feel pretty good. That's what I would like to do <laughs> in my time uh, when people are, are are gifting me their time to spend time with my characters. I want to make them feel better. I completely agree. That's why we invited you today, because that's a <laughs> message we agree with putting out in the world, uh, both for all the underrepresented groups that come forward and also, of course, for women in the world who haven't necessarily seen themselves portrayed in all the many facets that can be. And that's one of the things I loved at One Day at a Time. Um, as a child, I loved the show because I was the daughter of uh, the first Catholic divorced woman in her family. My, my relatives are from Sicily, immigrants. And it was shocking that she was divorced and she was on television and that was what my mother was. So to see that representation, the family was okay, was amazing. So now you've taken that and given us a veteran, a female veteran, right? Who has this experience at war that we don't see women live through. So how did that come about? How did that idea come to you? Well, it really is, uh, you know, the collaboration of myself, Mike Royce and Norman Lear. Uh, you know, Mike's daughter was coming out at the time that we were doing the pilot. Um, she's, we have permission to discuss that. So we did get permission from her <laughs> to discuss. Um, and Norman was a veteran. So Norman came in and said, you know, how about the ex-husband is a veteran? Why don't we make the ex-husband a veteran? And we were like, oh, that's really good. That's really interesting. And as we were talking to veterans, we realized a lot of veterans meet, meet one another in service and a lot of veterans marry veterans. Yes. And so then it was like, well, wait a minute. Why are we giving this super interesting thing to a person we're not going to be spending time with, this off this off-screen character? Why don't we also have Penelope be a veteran? And then they both met in service and, they, you know, like it just seemed like a really cool uh, thing to investigate. And so we had a, a, a consultant's. Um, Musa, that was our our military consultants, and we had a lot of female veterans come in and male veterans come in and talk about what it was like and being married to somebody in service and the different experiences that the men and the women have and how it really affects marriages in a big way and how 9-11 affected them. Like all of it, you know, really all of that texture really came um, at the service of of speaking to actual veterans and and trying to honor their experience. But it also came from you asking that very important question, why waste that on a side character when we could put it onto the female character, which again, wasn't the first idea that came to people. Right. That really speaks to your 
the representation you brought into that room. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does. Um, and also I have to ask you, because the original show did not have a grandmother. So at what point did you decide, of course, a grandmother, right? And then Well, for me, that was my first meeting with Norman. He sat down and he said, what would it look like if you were divorced? And I said, oh, if I were, if I got divorced, my parents would live with me. They'd move in. I mean, right now they live across the street. Okay. Like we're real Latino. <laughs> we're, everybody loves Raymond right now. My parents literally live across the street. Uh, so a thousand, it's just, that's what we do. It, it's very cultural that we will eventually take in our parents. That's just, we just do that. Um, and so if I, if, if I, I didn't have a husband anymore, my, my mom would live with me. That's just what would happen. And so then Norman asked about my mom. Tell me about your mom. And I've been describing my mother this way my whole life. I said, picture Rita Moreno and with a heel and some lipstick. And that's my mom. And I have been saying that literally my whole life. And Norman was like, oh, I'm friends with Rita. We should get Rita. And I was like, <laughs> okay, Norman. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll get Rita Moreno. Okay. And then uh, he called Rita Moreno and she said, yes. <laughs> Oh, that is such a beautiful story because what a beautiful thing for her to be doing at this stage in her career. What a beautiful contribution for her to be able to make. Yeah. Wow. Oh my God. And you made that happen. It's crazy. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. That is so beautiful. All right. Uh, I've got to go to this point because we're talking about representation of the room. So you had, there's a piece on a line because of course we looked up lots of cool stuff um, where you made the choice for your sophomore job because that is a big jump for writers. First job, maybe that's, wow, you got it. And then sometimes things peter out. Mm -hmm. But you had this choice to go from How I Met Your Mother and stay at a lower um, title uh, or to move into the George Lopez show, which would allow you a, a higher title and more money. But mm -hmm. you made a career choice that you needed not to be pigeonholed. Right? And I'm, I'm summarizing what you say in this piece because my question about it is, so you landed in How I Met Your Mother. And was there a, a time when you were happy, not just you knew that was good for your career, but you had a chance to be in a room that needed your voice? There was something you were able to say in the show that might not have been said or not have said that could have been said. I think, you know, every show I went on was such a great experience for so many reasons. I think that at that moment in time, I was also an age. I didn't have kids yet. I didn't. So I also felt like I didn't have a lot to speak to in terms of a family comedy experience. I was more in the, my friends were dating and we were all falling, everyone was falling in love. And so it also felt like that felt truer to my experience in my late twenties. I was, I was like 28, I think when I got on How I Met Your Mother and it was a young room. Um, the guys it was their first, you know, it was their first time being showrunners and we were all friends and would all hang out. And um, yeah, I think that all of us, I think every writer that passed through there left some really nice fingerprints of stories about their dating, stories about love. They left those those fingerprints on on that show for sure. Which is probably why it too was so successful because it's- And they had a lot of women, you know, they were really great. Carter and Craig were great. They hired a, a lot of women too. Oh, great. So their yeah. room was inclusive. Mm -hmm. Oh, yay. Well, that leads us to talk about your rooms and how you compose a room. Well, it's always what, so there, every show has specific needs. And I think that every showrunner thinks about what those specific needs are. And I, because I like to tell stories uh, about disenfranchised underserved voices, I am not always that either. Right. So like uh, I've, you know, the, the, a new show I'm working on right now has a trans character. So it was very important to me that I have trans voices in the room that can speak to that experience so that I'm getting it right and I'm honored. What I'm trying to do by writing the character is honor this community. So if I don't do the work of having the person behind the scenes to give me uh, an accurate, thoughtful uh, POV, then I'm not fully completing the circle of that, you know? So, uh, you know, Afro-Latino rep. So making sure I have Afro-Latino writers in the room. I am a white Latina. I walk the world as a, you know, in many times I walk, walk the world as a white woman. I pass, right? So I can't possibly understand or speak to the experience of what it is to walk the world as an Afro-Latina woman. And Afro-Latino representation is non-existent. Gina Torres, yeah. right? Like we, yeah. we think I, she's a goddess. So thank God we get her. But, <laughs> but well, I'm sorry. There's Rosario. There's, there's Tessa. There's, there's, uh, we have superheroes. But there's it's still a, a uh, small, Zoe. small. There's family. Zoe, but I'm talking more like TV and TV. Right. They're movie stars. Um, but, uh, 
yeah, we just need to do better. We just need to do better. So, yeah, so those experiences I think are really vital. Doing a, a big gay storyline, two gay men falling in love and what, you know, a really sweet story about two gay men falling in love. So I got to have some gay men <laughs> to speak to, you know. <laughs> so it's that. It's that. And so for one day at a time, uh, we were doing a specifically Cuban American experience, but I wanted to also tap into the universalities of the Latino experience. So what was really fun was being in the room and saying, "Hey, who who uh, of the Latinos in the room let whose parents let them go to sleepovers?" Yep, none of us. Okay, none. that's universal, right? Like it would be fun to see <laughs> what the chancla. Anyone else have a grandma that would take their slipper? Oh, all of us. All of us. Okay, cool. Uh, you know, like that kind of stuff. So it was, um, and that was really great. And that was really great too in terms of there was a there was a storyline once where Mike was like, oh, okay, and then Elena goes to her friend's house and spends the night. And I was like, nope. That's not going to happen. No, nope, that's not going to work. Gloria, that's just your family. And then I could go, guys, oh, oh, no, it's universal, you know, even on my own show, you know? And so Mike was like, oh, dang, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, you know, that's also the danger of like only one, right? When you have only one, then they're like, well, that's probably just your experience, but that's not universal. So that's why it's good to have more than one. If you can't look, writer's rooms are small. You can't possibly have every character that you put on screen in the room. I understand that. But I think for your main characters, you should try to do the due diligence of having a consultant at the very least just to make sure if, if in fact you are delving into that, right? Like I understand on a procedural that might not be as important. Uh, but for, for more, you know, dramas and, and comedies that are relying on the experience of the person, you know, let's, let's give a little love behind the scenes as well as in front of the camera. Exactly. And by the way, my Italian, my Sicilian grandfather, no sleepovers. No, no, no. I bought a house. You live in house. This is yes. good. House is good for you. Nobody, no yeah. other house. You, nobody will think you're poor if you have to live somewhere else. So, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty immigrant experience. I think. Yes. Pretty, yeah. You know, exactly. First gen. That's interesting. Wonderful. Okay. Well, um, one of the things that Athena is very interested in, of course, is leadership and female leadership representing that. So just wonder, you know, how you thought about that in terms of certainly Penelope represented that because being in the military has leadership qualities. Um, how else are you seeing that come through your work and maybe in your future ideas? You know, I really think in Hollywood, it's interesting to me that it's taken this long for women to sort of take the reins because in our households, we take, we have the reins. <laughs> and really, I feel like a set is ultimate. Like I'm big mom energy <laughs> on our sets, y you know, like it's, it, it's big mom energy. It's like you're organizing people. You're like, you go there, you do that. No, hey, we don't talk to people like that. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, you're, you're everybody's mom. That's what it is. So um, I think it's great. I treat it very similarly to how I treat being a parent um, is that like, let's all listen to each other and have respect and let's all, you know, be kind and let's do our work and do our very best. And then we can all have a really good time. Perfect. And I take it that's how you make sure your writer's room is um, a secure place, a safe place for people to open up about their real story. Yeah, I mean, Mike and I, day one, Mike and I are both, Norman Lear has a, has a saying that he thinks there are wet people and dry people. And, <laughs> and that Mike and I are wet people. Like we just cry. We're just, we're just emotional mush humans. So day one of the writer's room, we're like, we, Mike and I had already spent like so much time together. Uh, crying and telling stories and stuff. So we're like, listen, this is a safe space. There's a Kleenex box on the table. <laughs> um, you know, we uh, we want you to feel comfortable sharing your experiences if you're comfortable. And we also want this to be a safe space so that, you know, if people say something, like I would often, I, I remember often I would be like, okay, lesbians, I have a question. I don't, it, I might be wording it incorrectly. Please correct me if I'm saying something that's not right. And they'd be like, here we are for you, Gloria. <laughs> 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 oh, no, that was good. But then maybe you want to say, you'd want to say this. Okay, okay. Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're all operating uh, under the assumption that like we're, we're coming with kindness and under, and we're trying to bring about mutual understanding so how can we do that in, in a respectful way and so far it seems to have worked so far it seems to have worked people seem seem pretty happy yeah i love coming with kindness that's a beautiful phrase for people to take away oh good 
Did that come from relatives, friends, life experience? I just, want, I just want, I'm just trying to have a good time on this planet. That's it, man. That's it. Just trying to have a good time. I think we could all have a way better time if we were just a little bit nicer and more respectful. Really. I just want to try to have fun on this earth. I mean, I, that, that for me is the revolution. The revolution is when, when brown people and women can just have a good time and not feel like we're going to be killed or raped. I, I, that's it. That's all I want. Such a small thing. <laughs> it's not, you'd think, but it is revolutionary. It is revolutionary. It's true. It's true. Um, interesting. All right. So let me ask you this. Um, I'm hoping there's an, an answer to it. Ha is there a time when you've seen one of the stories you've been able to tell on television um, have a real effect in the real world? We, oh my through gosh. a fan letter or through an experience. Oh or, yeah, yeah. One day, I, that was such, that was the gift. That was the beautiful side effect of one day at a time. Yeah, our coming out story with Elena got. I mean, we would do panels and there would be a line after of mothers and daughters, mothers and grandmothers, um, daughter or uh, granddaughters and grandmothers, uh, grand you know nieces and 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 their aunts. Um, just saying like, I watched the show with my family and I came out to them and they felt less afraid for me as a result. They felt like it's going to be okay. And moms that would hug me and cry. And like, I mean, it was, it was uh, unbelievable. And the same would be true with the, with the PTSD. We did a whole episode about medication and therapy, mm -hmm. um, which is still a very taboo subject in a lot of communities of color, not just the Latino community. And we had so many people say, I was able to do there. I was able to explain to my parents medication. I was able to. So that was a huge when Schneider relapsed. Um, we had a lot of people reach out about showing, you know, this character that for a long time was just sort of this fun side character and giving him this depth and understanding uh, where, where his seemingly cheery attitude comes from and uh, how it's often a mask for, for sadness and, and feeling alone in this world. Yeah. I mean, we did a lot of, um, yeah, it was really, it was real. Oh, oh my gosh. The, the, the disabled community when we had Santina, the, the trans community, when we had Cynthia, um, Ramona was a, was a proud uh, Afro Latina lesbian veteran. Um, you know, Alex's girlfriend was a beautiful Afro Latina, uh, wealthy girl. You know, um, it, so many, so many. It was such a, it was just gift upon gift. Whenever we would, we would have people on the show, and you know, Santina. I remember a scene where the veteran group was at a bar after after therapy, and the ladies needed to leave the bar, and so Santina was in her wheelchair, and she was like, "Oh, I need like." I can't get out of the bar because it was these stairs <gasps> through the door. And I was like, Oh, that's fine. I was like, Hey, Bernie, can you guys do a ramp? Can we build a ramp? And so they built a ramp over lunch. They built a ramp and we came back to the set and there was a ramp there. And Santina started crying. And she was like, Gloria, you don't understand. We don't see ramps. We don't see a person in a wheelchair leave a building with a ramp. Like that's, we don't see that. And I couldn't, I was, I was like, it's a tiny things. These are not big things. And, and it meant so much to people. Um, my, we had a scene in the pilot where uh, she's eating, Penelope's eating leftovers. And in rehearsal, they had a Tupperware. And I had to go to props and say, like, yeah, we don't do Tupperware. We, it, immigrants were the first green people because we were poor. <laughs> so I needed to take, like, an old country crock container and I needed to, like <laughs> – Make it seem like it's been through the dishwasher a hundred times. That's what I want you to get. And so that's what we got, right? The amount of people that will just send me um, emails and tweets about like, I saw that butter tin. I, I saw that butter container with the food in it. And I was like, oh my God, I've never, how have I never seen this on TV? So th that stuff is so meaningful. My God. It tells people's real stories. Yeah. That's, and they don't see that very often. They just exactly. want to be seen. People just want to be seen. It's, it all boils down to that. And yet it seems so hard to move that forward. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's one of my questions. What else can we do as an industry? What else can people entering the industry do to help move these ideas forward and bring these stories forward? I think write them. I think they just need to write and pitch them. I think, uh, I think it, it works when you do it. I think that the, you know, the, the fan love is so real and I think it's important. 
I think that now we are in a different time where social media is as impactful as, as ratings. There's a Nielsen's now for social media uh, that, that helps to track uh, the demo of your show because it's a younger demographic that's on, that's on TikTok and, and Twitch and, you know, and all of the, all of the various platforms. Um, yeah, I think we just need to write it and be open, be open to trying something that's a little bit more interesting. I mean, for me, I loved watching Rami because I loved watching just the a Muslim experience. But then why not have a best friend who's like a paraplegic in a wheelchair who's super funny? Like that was an extra thing that they did. How great. And you don't think, you know, it doesn't have to be the kooky best friend. I mean, he still got to be a kooky best friend, actually. <laughs> yeah, no, he did. Exactly. And then there are many people, obviously, who have whatever the differently abled issues are, who are just, they're people. Hello. How hard is yeah. that? Yeah. And we forget to show that on television. Yeah. That's wonderful. That's so wonderful. So when you were a child, what shows influenced you? Oh, I loved sitcoms. I loved sitcoms. I loved like, uh, and I loved fame. I was really into fame. Loved it. My favorite. Love Boat. Love Fancy Island. But like Facts of Life, a Norman Lear show. Uh, who's the boss? A Norman Lear show. <laughs> Which flipped some gender, did some yeah. gender flipping way back in the day. Yeah, yeah. How interesting. Do you think you recognize those innovations back then? I mean, at what point did you look back at what you watched in television and realize that it had helped you? It was your, it was your university before you even thought about it. Oh, I thought about. I mean, I also really loved soap operas, so I watched. I would come home and watch a soap. Uh, while I was doing my homework and I realized later I watched Santa Barbara and I watched General Hospital and Young and the Restless and Days of Our Lives. Like I, I, I really had a pretty good knowledge of many soap operas. And I realized that Pam Fryman was the director on Santa Barbara. And I was like, oh, Pam, that makes so much sense. You've been educating me since I was 12. Uh, <laughs> and Norman, you've been educating me since I was 12. I mean, 12 is like roughly when I remember really being like, oh, this is a thing. This is a this is a magical medium that can make people feel things, and that's really powerful. Oh yeah, I always I often tell students the story in, uh, in Justice Sotomayor's autobiography. She mentions that when she saw Perry Mason, she learned about the job of being a lawyer, and that convinced her that she should try for it. You're like Perry Mason. Well, you know, it was a very staid, sort of slow show, but it had that effect. Yeah, well, you know, I'm I'm good friends with Chris Nee, who who wrote. Um, Doc McStuffins. And she said the amount of young black girls now who are going into STEM programs because they want to be a doctor because they saw a cartoon where a little black girl was a doctor. Like, amazing. You need okay. to see it to be it sometimes, you know? Exactly. Exactly. All right. So here's a tough question for writers, but it helps up and coming writers all the time to hear this. Clearly, you're going to pitch a lot of things and they're not always going to fall. So how do you deal with being said no to? How do you deal with rejection? I always, there's so much rejection, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> it's part of it. It's part, you have to get real good at just being a duck and letting it right, fly out right off your back. I always focus on my why. Why am I doing this? And my why is pretty serious. My why is two immigrant kids at 15 years old, not speaking the language saying, can we make it in this country? Fighting tooth and nail to educate me my grandparents making very difficult decisions to send their children here, the great sacrifice that they all made, and my deep duty to speak to this beautiful community that I have to celebrate and to leave a legacy, not only for my children, but for other children out there so that they can see themselves and know that they deserve love and kindness and goodness in their life. I mean, that is it. That's it. I just sit with that. I sit with that. And then you go, all right, let's get back to it. There's not a lot of time for wallowing. You can be, I mourn, you know, I'll give myself a day to mourn something if it, if it, if it passes, but then you got to just get on with it. I agree. And it's tough. It's tough for people. It's tough. Sometimes. Listen, one day at a time was my dream come true. It was my dream come true. It was my dream job. I loved it. I would have done it for 20 years. Honestly, I loved the people. The people were like my family, you know, Justina Rita, we're all on an email. We're all on a text chain. We text each other constantly. Rita's like, you have to watch this documentary. I'm like, okay, Rita. I mean, we're all just a fan. We love each other. And we it's love- your grandmother. She became we, your I grandmother. Know, and we loved working together. And um, it broke my heart. It broke my heart to have to fight so hard for that beautiful little show. 
it broke my heart that that we weren't getting the ad dollars to to promote it properly. To, every step of the way, it was a fight, but I loved it. So, you know, you get you love and you go okay. When it was over, it was like okay, this is over. Sad. Now let's get back to it. I don't have time to waste, man. I'm only here for so long. Let's let's get on with it. Well, the beauty is it exists forever, right? In some iteration and yeah. reruns, it's always going to be there for another well, generation. Every, every day on Twitter, somebody new sees it and sends me something. So it's exactly. very nice. Exactly. That is the legacy. Yeah. That, that writers are given in this world. Oh, that's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. I love that. All right. I'm very interested in, um, I'm sure it was through the news and just knowing about this, but um, the, the episode that stuck to me the most was the episode about the young friend whose parents had been deported. Mm. How did you get that story through? And, you know, what have you heard about it since? Well, that one was Norman's idea. So Norman came in and said, let's do an episode where Rita's character, where Lydia is at the grocery store and gets deported because that's a thing that's happening is that people are going to grow, you know, domestic workers are going to grocery stores and getting caught by ice and being deported. And so I had to say, well, Norman, different Latinos have different rules in this country. Cubans can't be deported. Or at least they couldn't at the time. I don't know. If, right. yeah. I don't know under under forty five's administration what. But that's over. So what happened? <laughs> um, but at the time, we could not be. We Cubans can't be deported. We have different rules. And he was like, "What do you mean you have different rules?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, different different people have different rules. Different people have different standings in this country." Um, you know, the, the, it's it's interesting that you know uh, there's this bizarre story out there that i mean latinos aren't even the number one uh undocumented people that come here yeah. uh and yet they're because they're brown and from the south it's like oh they're scary people so um so i was like but we can have a character that that happens to but if we're gonna do that we should set her up because i don't want to do one very special episode uh, I want to set it up so that we get to know her in a different context, and then this is a surprise. So that's what that's what Mike and I did. We we set up Carmen early on as this funny goth <laughs> Latina, uh, and um, and then we got to know her and we got to like her, and then as a result, uh, we 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 got to do this storyline. That was a really hard episode. It was a hard episode because any episode where you're trying to talk about an issue, you don't want to be didactic. You know, you you're trying to do it in a way that that appeals to people's humanity and, and try to come at it from like a really, a really real place, even though you're, you're dramatizing it. So it was a, it was a tricky one to crack. And it was also a tricky one to make funny uh, because it's a very serious issue as, as were many of the issues that, that we did on the show. So, so it was, it was a tricky one to crack, but, but I, but I feel like we got there and and we're really proud of the episode. It was beautiful. And it was you, exactly what you described. So important for students to listen to. You knew you couldn't do the very special episode. How boring and stupid would that would be right. more exploitive than anything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I remember watching it and thinking, oh, I love that character. Now I'm going to lose I her. Know. I'm upset about that, that. You know, listen, the great pain was we loved Ariel Barrera so much that it was like, can we have Carmen? Can we just bring Carmen back? And then she booked a job. So we oh. actually wrote a bunch of episodes with Carmen on FaceTime or on a on Zoom, and she she became a superhero for Marvel. So what are you gonna do? And now yeah. she's on uh, the Rebel Rebel show, with the new Aaron Brockovich show. She's killing it. So she's fine. <laughs> and you guys gave her the platform to show off her talents. Your show gave her that opportunity. Remarkable young woman. That's a beautiful thought. So that reminds me, how involved did you get in casting? Obviously, very. The main oh my god, no, casting is my everything. Every because it's a collaboration. It's a collab. I have such deep respect for actors that put themselves on the screen. Deep respect. It's so hard. Oh my God. When I was acting, I remember one day where I went to an audition back when I was doing both. Okay. So I went to an audition that was running an hour and a half behind. There are, it's a room full of people that are cuter and less cute versions of you. Okay. So it's like a room of you in various forms. I finally went in there. It's nine pages of dialogue you have to memorize. I finally get in there an hour and a half. I waited. I finally get in there and they're like, we're just doing the third scene, which is one page. I did the one scene and they were like, the, they were literally on their phones. They were just like, I was like, what am I even what? And I left feeling so like, what am I doing? And that afternoon I had a writer's meeting 
And so uh, that afternoon, I changed my clothes in my car as the typical actor that <laughs> changed my clothes in my car, go into this writer's meeting and I get there. I'm like, hi, I'm here to meet. I don't remember Jeff Gold, Jeff Golden. Or I don't remember somebody at Fox. And, um, and they were like, oh, yes, Miss Calderon Keller, of course. Can we get you coffee or a, a Diet Coke? Or I was like, I would love a Diet Coke. Get me a cold Diet Coke. I'm sitting in the street. It's just me. It's just me waiting with my cold Diet Coke. And I'm like, oh, oh, this is better. This is be Then I go in. I sit with him for 45 minutes where he's so interested to hear about me. And then I'm like, what am I doing? This is better. <laughs> so... Actors have to do that, have to memorize pages of dialogue every day, then go up on the screen and then and then put the heart and soul into your work. So it's a deep collaborative process. I need to feel a connection to the actor. That that's really the truth. It's a really um it's a really personal experience to me because I really also get in there. I really get in there. So, you know, that's what when Justina came in and it was like I had been losing parts to Justina for years. <laughs> Years. I, I literally would go in and be like, did Justina Machado I just I'm just gonna go home then. Because she's just a better actor than me. I can say it. That's okay. I think she's literally probably the best actress of, of my generation. So to go up again, it's like Meryl Streep. It's like, oh well, Justina should get it. She's the fuck, she's the best. She's available. You should you should not hire me, you should hire her. So I've been losing parts for years. So when when I saw that she was available, because I thought she was on Queen of the South, and I really wanted her to come in because we're similar too, you know, we're similar vibe. She came in and it was just like, oh my God. She's just remarkable. Remarkable. She is. And uh I just felt, I just felt it. And then, you know, and now she's like my sister. You know, we we talk all the, you know, we're just very, we're very, very, very close. Me and everybody, Isabella, Marcel, like the it, we we really got in there and we knew the specialness of of us getting to all be together to do this thing and it was a very personal uh journey and everybody was kind and and sweet and yeah i would i could make call, i call about actors i say are they difficult are they you know i don't i don't play with that because it's a really personal thing exactly so that makes me think what people really need to know are what are the other jobs of show running that you had to learn that weren't inherent, you know, obviously the writing is the writing, the casting, you had acting experience. Was there a thing that you had to train yourself? Well, you know, I was it? really fortunate that I worked on shows where some of the, some of the show runners like to do everything themselves. Um, I think that they may not be aware that there is a real opportunity for learning. I don't think that the, the I, I think I didn't know that I could ask. Um, but Carter and Craig in particular, uh, the How I Met Your Mother showrunners, were very generous in letting us be in on stuff. So, like, I would be in on casting. So, I I ran many casting sessions. I was a producer in the room many times. Um, they would let me be in editing with Sue Fetterman. I would sit in with Sue and and see, like, oh, edit, figure out what editing was. Uh, so, they would let us sit in on production meetings. So, all that was – Rob Thomas also let me sit in on editing, which I was really grateful for. So, it's like all of those people that let you sit in on those things make it so that when you're in the seat, you just know how to do it. So, I knew how to do the the casting. I knew how to sit in editing. Um, I was fortunate enough to do the showrunner training program that the Writers Guild puts together. So, John Wells came in and gave an incredible, uh, incredible breakdown of budgets and how to deal with budgets. Also how to sit down with your department heads and be very clear. So, and because I had been doing the theater, actually, I had such a clear idea. So I'm very, I have a very specific vision. And then it's about communicating that vision to your department head so that they can effectively do their job. And, you know, again, women are very communicative, tend to be more communicative. And I feel like the, the times where showrunners did a great job is when they were very communicative with their department heads. I mean, you're the CEO of a multi-million dollar company when you're a showrunner. That's what it is. They're giving you $30 million and go make a show. And um, you have to effectively communicate with everybody and try to find a way to do it for that budget. And be comfortable delegating to other people and yes. trusting the other people that you've hired. Yes. But I so much of that is clarity of thought. You know, if I come in, like Mike and I would never come in blue skying it. I was on shows where it's like, I don't know. What do you think they do? And it's hours of like, go to the circus. Go, you know, like you're just like, I don't know. 
buy a hat. I don't know. What is it? Never, I never come in like that. Mike and I come in going, this is what we, we want to do an episode about colorism. I tell a story about, I was, I talked to my brother. He called me up. He was at the beach in San Diego and somebody told him to go back to Mexico. And he was like stunned. And then he was like, well, first of all, I'm not Mexican, but like, don't say that to anybody. You, You know? And I was like, what did you freak out when he's like, no, I was so shocked. I was like, what, what year is it? What's happening? And so I was like, so that just happened to my brother because he's darker. I'm very fair skin. He's very dark skin. There's a thing called colorism in the Latino community. And then our black writers like that's also exists in the black community. We're oh my God, let's talk about colorism. So let's do an episode where something happens to Alex. As a result of that, the, the family talks about colorism. And then we, we find a way to Elena realizes that she's white passing. And what does that mean? Let's see if we can actually craft something where that's the, the kickoff to this, to this episode. And then Mike and I will go do something, but we have a very clear directive of here's what we want to do. And here's where we want to go. So that when we come back, it's like, okay, where, do, where are you guys at? And they can say, well, we were thinking maybe a way in was like, he's at a game and he, or maybe he gets in a fight at school and, oh, I like the fight at school thing. That's really good. That's how it goes. So clarity, clarity and communication. It's beautiful. That's true in so many other businesses. And that's a female <laughs> skill. <laughs> that's so funny. Lovely. So you're speaking to, of course, the beauty of the whole sort of brain trust and the ability to brainstorm together and be comfortable. Oh my God. You, no showrunner is doing it alone. You have so many people there to help you. And it really is about being so clear. I mean, I send... Pinterest pages. I, I mean, we're, there's just such clarity uh, about what I like and what I don't like. And then that makes it easier for people to say, oh, no, she doesn't love purple. <laughs> I don't know. You know, whatever. Right. So that they can they can judge accordingly. That's so beautiful. So I want to ask you the nuts and bolts question from a writing standpoint. In the beginning, what was your writing process and how do you manage it with all the other things you have to manage as a showrunner? Well, I'm a really good multitasker. And for me, having more than one project at once is a real gift because sometimes you do feel stuck. Um, I don't think it's writer's block because I don't believe, I don't believe that like there's a, a inspiration cupid that you have to wait for to shoot the inspiration arrow into you. I think that is a a falsehood that's been sold to artists. We have to go, hey Cupid, come here. <laughs> you, there's no if you're doing this every day, you don't have time to wait for Cupid's arrow, right? To 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 puncture you with inspiration. You've got to do it on the regular and you have to just make it a habit and a practice. Yeah. So, for me it's when I'm feeling like, "Uh, eh, I'm a little stuck here. I can put that to the side and then go to another one and jump in there or read or or listen to music or do something to sort of um get my brain back into a creative headspace. Um, but yeah, it's just really about delegating. It's about delegating my time. It's about delegating to other trusted people uh, so that everything can, all the trains can run on time and everyone can hopefully have a really good time doing it. I mean, it's a cool thing we get to do. It's a really cool thing we get to do. There's people that are behind a desk crunching numbers. We don't have to do that. We sit and get paid to think. What? That's amazing. But in order to do that, you have to have a real respect for the art of what this is, for the format, for the for the process, for um, for all of it, and really put in the time and the work uh, because you the cream rises to the top. That's that's it. I agree. All right, I have one more question because we only have a couple minutes left, and we're so thankful for your time. But I do want to ask this because you've referenced kids as well, and of course. We understand that we in, in Hollywood, people have backups and help for their children, and you have grandparents living across the street. Yes, I do. But of course, how do you do the managing of yeah. your real yeah. life and your work life? Well, you need help. That's it. You need help in whatever form that is for you. I think that uh, being a mother was very important to me, and I was not going to stop my life to do it. I know many people who are like, oh, I'm just going to wait till I get that thing, and then I'm going to... I, I was not a believer in that. I was like, I know I want to have a kid when I'm 28 and another one when I'm, when I'm 32. And that's what I did. Right. Like um, there were certainly, it was hard. I mean, the, the real is it's hard. It's hard. It makes people nervous when you're a pregnant woman on a set, whether they like to admit it or not, there's like a vibe. Uh, when you're out of the game, I was out of the game for a year with, with my first child. I took a year off um, and that was hard. It was hard. It was hard to get back in. It's true. You just have to acknowledge what the difficulties you're going to be in, then how you're going to make a successful plan of attack to return. And I had all of that really well thought out. With my second child, 
I decided to, I, I went to a job interview when I was pregnant and I let him know, like, I'm like, I am, you can't tell, but I'm pregnant. So I, this baby will come out of me at some point and I will need some time. And he said, how much time do you need? And I said, eight weeks. Great. So I took eight weeks and honestly, that was not enough. Uh, and I was kind of a disaster. I felt like I went back to that. Sh they were so lovely to me. They set up a nursery for me so I could bring my baby, my mom, like they, they really were, were lovely in terms of being generous, uh, in allowing me time to go down and breastfeed my baby and stuff. But I was not for me personally, I needed more time than that. I needed like six months to get myself back on track. Cause it did take, took such a toll on my body both times. Um, so I think you just need to to assess and do your best and then set yourself up to have help. You have to have help. You cannot do this. You need a supportive spouse who works from home. You need a nanny. You need a parent. Uh, there is no way I could do the life that I have if I didn't have my mom and dad across the street. No way. It's, and, and having a, a employing situation where they are going to at least try to offer the things that you need. Right. And look, the, the great news is uh, being the boss is the best for being a parent because I dictate the hours, right? So like I we're done at five or six because I want to go home and have dinner with my kids and do homework with them and do stories and go to bed. But then at 915, my computer goes back on and I'm working until probably one, you know, and that's just the real I'm do doing cuts, making notes on scripts, uh, you know, writing it out like, like whatever it is. So it's, it's, you know, you got to love it. You got to love it and be willing to put in that amount of time when you're, when you're in production. I mean, right now I just, there's a show that I might have to do in Canada and they're like, because of COVID, we don't think you can come back home. Like we think you just have to stay up there the whole time. Cause it's a two week, uh, two week quarantine in between. So you can't like go home for the weekend and then go back. Like it won't work. Well, I'll try to, I have to figure that out. Right. How does that work? Because I am a hands-on parent. <laughs> so what does that look like? How does that work? I also run a room where on day one, I say, everybody here has somebody that's important to them. Or or a, if it's your pet, if it's your best friend, if it's your dad, if it's your kids, you have somebody that like you is super important to you. If they have something and you need to leave, you get to leave. So that's day one. So we had Bridget Munoz Leibowitz, her, she, unfortunately, her friend was, was very sick with cancer and she would get to go and take her to chemo. And we would, we had a, you know, Audra Seeloff had, had a problem with her dog. It needed to go search. She got to go. So it's not just the parents were like my kid, you know, my kid was doing a presentation at two 30. I'm going to go to the kid's presentation and I'll be right back. And that worked fine. It worked fine. Everyone got to live their lives. Um, and that, that it hasn't always been the case. <laughs> I was in, I was in one room where after somebody's rehearsal dinner, they had to come back to work. So um, that's not how I do. Oh, that is the most beautiful place that we can stop because we want other people to do how you do. That is how the, the business should run. So I have to thank you for being with us today uh, on behalf of the Athena Film Festival at the Stevens College MFA. Thank you so much. Thanks, you guys. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram. I do Q&As all the time. I'm now on Clubhouse as well. I try to pop on there and give some advice. I have a Hollywood 101 series on YouTube that is free. It's a master class that's 11 episodes. So check all that stuff out and good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much.